69. We are only 69 Patreon supporters away from hitting our first goal. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. For less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, you can help support the show. We are only 69 Patreon subscribers away from hitting our goal, which will allow this channel to continue to grow and prosper so we can bring you the best content possible. For more information, check the link down below and join us on Patreon. I would really appreciate your support. Thank you. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. One. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and today I have a really good special guest, uh, Blake Miles. We're going to be covering a wide range of topics uh, and including, you know, the James River. But first, I want to get into when I when I do a little bit of research, I write down notes of my first impressions. And the one thing that popped up immediately on FLW's founding member of the JMU Bass Fishing Club. And I guess it's because this hits to me because I went to a school that didn't have a club. And I had to basically throw it all on my back to get going just to be able to fish college. Blake, how did all that start? Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting story. So coming out of high school, I really was torn between JM, JMU and East Carolina. And really what was pulling me to East Carolina was they had a very established fishing team. Ronnie Moore was there at the time. Uh, they had a great team with a lot of history. Um, ended up deciding to go to JMU. And at the time, I thought, you know, I'll just continue to fish locally jump in bfls kind of grow that way and then i actually went to a high school uh, i guess it was a regional championship up on champlain and uh ended up was like when i was there and that was during my first semester at college because the way the schedules lay out um and i was like man i can't not do this in college right traveling and all that yeah. so i started looking into it and trying to figure out what all it was going to take and uh ended up meeting one who's one of my best friends now his name is daniel met him through his roommate who was on the club golf team with me at JMU. And uh, we both kind of put our heads together. He ended up being vice president for two or three years, and I was president for two or three years. And we kind of just ran with it, right? We wanted to build it up from literally zero. Uh, we were worried about our cards declining when we got to uh, Chautauqua, which was the last tournament of our freshman year, to where when we graduated, there was five digits in the bank account for those guys to spend. So um, it was pretty cool building that up and, yeah, kind of, Lake Chautauqua. God damn, you were bringing. I don't even know if I have my Lake Chautauqua trophy in here. Was that that was the FLW back in the day, right? Yeah, back in the old FLWs. God, that was fun. And what I really liked about that format, the way they had it, was. And guys, if you don't know, here's a little history lesson. Back in the old days, you actually had to be either it was the top fifteen or top ten uh, in the tournaments to qualify for your regional, mm -hmm. and from there you had to be in the top ten to qualify for the championship. And I kind of like that because it did put more on points and actually being consistent versus this win in your end type of type of deal that they have now. Yeah, uh, when we were there, it was they had three three tournaments for each division or region, yep. I forget what they called it. And uh, you had to place in the top ten of one of the tournaments to make nationals. They kind of got rid of that middle step, uh, so there ended up being that anywhere from one hundred and eighty to two hundred and twenty votes at nationals every year. Damn. It would be the top ten percent of the field. So if you had 150 boats, right, it would go to 15 boats that would qualify. But the North region typically never had more than 100. Most I ever saw at FLW was like 110. What was that like fishing collegially, just from a competition standpoint, getting to move around the country? Because that's really, if it wasn't for college fishing, I wouldn't have been able to go from Florida to, to Canada, basically. Yeah, no, I, exactly the same. So I had really only fished Bugs Island, the James River, and Lake Gaston my whole life, uh, and really only ever had success on the James. And then I uh, went to college and got my butt whooped a lot, uh, realized how much there was to learn, realized that I sucked with electronics. Hell, I didn't have electronics. Um, learned, got it, ended up investing in that, uh, worked with Lawrence for a little bit, so got pretty versed with it. And then, I mean, I feel like, the lessons I learned just from working with sponsors is the reason that I have even my full-time job today or uh, have had any experience that I have has come from the life lessons that college fishing gave me, the chance to run a budget, um, to figure out travel. Like now I'm not stressed at all about going to Lake Norman next week. I know what I'm getting into. Mm -hmm. I know how to look for the deals for the hotels and stuff like that. And when you're in college, like you definitely got to try and figure that out, especially with a budget. 
You mentioned how that was how that was important with your job. What, what are you doing now? Are you in the fishing industry? I'm not. I'm just in outside sales. But I think that with uh, with working with companies and, and customers, that's really important. And got that experience through the fish the tackle shop I worked at at school through the sponsors that we worked with. Like we went to ICAST. Uh, I went once. Danny went twice with sponsors that we worked with. And we literally worked the booth. We didn't do the old sponsor soliciting. Obviously, we walked around, went and saw products, had a couple of meetings with other sponsors, but really just focused on looking at the business side of it because I knew that I, I'm always torn on getting into the fishing industry. Obviously, I'd love that dream, but when you make your passion your job, it can then quickly become not your passion. So I've kind mm -hmm. of focused on making fishing separate from work. That's, that's good advice. Uh, I think there's a lot of people that actually struggle with that. Um, really taking, you know, play time and mixing that with work. Uh, it, it's, it can be definitely a handful if you don't compartmentalize it. Yeah. When I left Shenandoah university for better or worse, the club died very quickly. And, and part of it, I think is location. Part of it was the school wasn't really, it, it wasn't their main focus was, was that club mm -hmm. for, for you trying to sell bass fishing to JMU and, and your friends. Because honestly, I remember when I had to get the club, and again, this was a little bit early, earlier on than when you did it, you had to have so many Impressive people in the club. Same questions. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, you have to have like so many people in the club, you gotta have all this stuff set up. And so I just basically got a bunch of friends just sign and say, you're gonna be part of the club. I don't care if you show up. Like, but was it a hard sell for you to get people involved and get the school on board? Oh, absolutely. So in order to be considered a sport club, which is where you can eventually be qualified for a little tiny bit of funding. I think the most we ever got was a grand. Um, the, in order to be qualified as a sport club, you have to have paying members. So they have to pay dues and you have to have 10 members. So I remember my freshman year, we had eight members and I paid my two suite mates dues just to put their names on there just because I wanted to fish term. Wow. So, yeah. I mean, we, we had to figure it out. I and mean, when we graduated, we had like 50 or 60 members. So. How did you get it to grow so fast? So we did something that I thought was pretty unique. We kind of separated from a competitive side and I kind of stole this from our club golf team, but uh, we had like the competitive side of the team and they paid a little bit steeper dues. And then we had more of a social side that would do trips to Mumal or to the local rivers around JMU. Or um, I think we did Anna once as well. And basically just like a fishing trip, a boys fishing hmm. trip and, they paid smaller dues. You know, we'd have hangouts at school. We had a group chat where, hey, I'm, I'm going to float the Shenandoah. Who's going to come with me? Stuff like that. Um, and then the competitive side of it was higher dues. We had, I think, 10 to 15. I think the peak was like 15 competitive members. Wow. Typically, we had, uh, I think we went from two boats my freshman year. Um, we might have had a third, but I don't think he really fished much. Um, to where we had four or five my senior year when we uh, ended up not fishing any tournaments because it was COVID year. But um, and then I think now they've got at least two boats. I, I want to say three. I, I keep I can't remember how old some of the guys are, so I can't remember if they've graduated or not. But I try to keep up with it. That is, um, you know that that that's fascinating. Being at JMU, what is considered your home water? Because that was the biggest issue with Winchester, Virginia. Is like, if you were going to have tournaments or get-togethers, where the heck are you going to do them? Lake Anna. You get up at 3.30 and you drive to Lake Anna. Holy shit. Yeah, that's it. I mean, those Sunday morning tournaments they have down there, we would... I mean, I can't tell you how many of those I woke up at uh, 3.30, 3.15 and either hopped in the truck with my old boss or drove over myself and probably stayed up too, night, too late last night and trying to hide that off my face and keep it moving, right? Jeez, man, that's insane. So, so, so there was, getting there, out of, there was of a lake nearby, it was called like Egypt Bend, but it's like you could run from end to end in three minutes, but it's the only place you could even run out nearby. Yeah, that's a place I still need to visit. I mean, it, it's kind of like Riverton, I guess, up near Front Royal. Same thing, just dammed off part of the Shenandoah, you know, Shenandoah River. Uh, but yeah, that, that's fascinating to me because it's so hard in this area of the country where we don't have a lake. And honestly, the Shenandoah Valley needed one. Like, it, it's it's such a prime spot to have a big reservoir, but it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Now, you leaving college and, and going back, back to where you normally live, 
how did you then make the jump from college to fishing legit, like, you know, adult tournaments, sort of speak, for lack of a better term, yeah. the Elite 70, yeah, for yeah, example. Yeah, and, and losing money left and right. Um, yeah. No, I, went, I moved to Virginia Beach, which if you live in Virginia Beach and you fish tournaments, uh, more power to you. My buddy Jake and Wyatt, they still do it. I think my, actually my buddy Bo just moved down there too, but uh, more power to you because traveling from there sucks. Um, there's nothing nearby. You're an hour and a half from any tournament fishery. Um, but we, I ended up joining the Elite 70 with my buddy Cooper. And we we decided to fish that over like BFLs um, because there is an off limits period, and I really like the the format. I think that Steve runs a great tournament, um, and the payout ratio is really good. Um, it's like eighty nine percent or ninety percent on the on the Virginia Elite seventy, and where BFLs are seventy two percent. So uh, started fishing that, and then actually after two years of that, I, I added the BFLs in this year, um, just. Wanting to play for that All American, I think that that's something I want to try and accomplish. So, yeah. How how did you even find the Elite Seventy, and how did you get involved in that? Because if I'm not mistaken, it's a lottery ticket, right, to get in or something like that. Yeah, it's um. So my boss at school fished it. Um, he's been fishing them since they started. His name's Delby. He used to own a tackle shop up there, uh, and basically, I fished one with him at Gaston, and we actually cut a check in it, uh, but. I fished one with him down there. And then I had always heard of it since it started. A lot of the big names in the Richmond and Virginia area fished the Elite 70, either fished it or had fished it. Um, and then when I started looking at tournaments, I kind of knew Steve. I knew that what the tournament was, and I just put my name in the hat and got in. <laughs> That's really cool. Because, yeah, I mean, you had, you had like, I know, and I, I couldn't find this year's results for like the James River, but seventh place last year on the James with, I mean, again, yeah. guys, lead 70, this is stiff competition that you're going up against. Yeah, we we I, we didn't stink it up this year on the James. I want to say we were like 25th, something like that, but left some opportunities out there. Cooper caught a big one and I couldn't get anything to go with it. Well, let's, let's make that segue now. Like the James River, the, 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 the title James portion, as you guys know, uh, I've covered, I've had multiple guides on covering really from the, the break line of Richmond all the way up to the Jackson and, and that whole portion. It's been a while since we've had somebody on to talk about the title part. Like how, how did you get familiar with that place and how have you grown in experience like you have to where, you know, you're, you're finishing in the top 10. Yeah. It comes back to my childhood, uh, fishing in the local pond in my parents' neighborhood, met a young boy and my family doesn't fish. Uh, my parents, my mom always jokes. She's like, I don't know how I ended up with two redneck kids. Uh, your, your dad golfs, your, my brother hunts and I fish. So, uh, I don't know how it happened, but you know, I ended up fishing out there with a buddy a couple times and then his, him and his dad fished tournaments and we jumped in some high school tournaments on the river. And really, I'd say that they kind of hit him and his, or his stepdad, his grandpa and him really showed me kind of the ropes around tournament fishing. We made a lot of mistakes together stuck on sandbars together, stuff like that. But also like I got really comfortable because I got to fish with, I mean, Steve's one, Steve Lamb is, is his grandpa's name. He's won a ton of money out there. Um, so I got to fish with some of the best guys out there and and learning how to read the water was really important because spots are going to change. That changes year, year over year, especially on a tidal fishery where it silts in, but the reading the water, understanding what, when to bail, when to move, I was able to pick a lot of that up, still learning it every day, but give me a head start on some of the guys my age. How would you compare and contrast the Potomac river with the James? Because they are two tidal bodies of water, but I feel like sometimes they're completely different. Every time I hear somebody say that they're the same, I want to smack them in the mouth. <laughs> uh, they're not. Uh, I'm going to call you out. You said mm -hmm. that the Potomac is easy. You can catch 12 pounds a day there. No problem. If you don't, you suck. Well, about two weeks after you said that, I went out there and dropped a zero <laughs> at BFL. So... Where were you fishing? Uh, everywhere. That was the problem. Uh, I had actually never been to the Potomac until I launched my boat at Smallwood that morning. Uh, just went in blind. My brother graduated the night before. So, oh so I drove up there, launched a boat, went into full spin out mode and sucked it up. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a totally different story, but I, yeah, I, I feel like, and I want to, I want to hear that story. Yeah. I feel like the James, this is from my limited knowledge, James, my, my limited knowledge of the James and growing up on the Potomac, I feel like the Potomac, every major Creek on that river, you could sit in for, for 12 hours and you could catch a limit. 
you you might not win, but you'll catch a limit. The James feels like it's way more inducive to do milk runs to make the long runs versus the Potomac. And it might be because of all the grass beds. It, I think it is because, of, and granted, I have a total of like 11 days of experience on the Potomac. So take everything I say about that place with a grain of salt. Um, did pop a third place in Elite 70 there this year, so that was cool. Um, but That's pretty damn good. <laughs> Yeah, it was two weeks after I zeroed the BFL. So really fun turnaround there. But uh, really, to be honest with you, it was like the way I see the difference is there's a lot more current on the James. It's a narrower body of water. So the water moves at a higher velocity. I can't feel the current on the Potomac. There's certain areas where you can, right? Um, you get up towards DC, you get back in like Chickamauxin, Mattawoman, you can feel some current there. But those grass flats, you kind of have to look down at the grass to see which way yeah. it's flowing. You're not going to yeah. feel it. Um, and so, and I've never really fished grass flats like that. People say the Chickahominy and the James have grass. They don't have grass beds. We've got hydrilla on the edge of the channel and lily pads. And there's no beds like that. Yes, there's lessons you can take from each. But fishing an expansive grass flat like that, the only time I'd ever done that was the upper bay in college. And mm. honestly, I did it in practice. And bailed and went and fished brush piles. So, um, like that's spanging. it's a big, big difference between the two. Yeah, I, the current you hit the nail on the head with that. Like the couple of times I fished a college tournament down there, and I think I fished two high school tournaments as well. Case in point, the current rips, especially in chicks uh, in, in the chick. And I think that also makes the fish move a lot more. And I think that's also inducive for a, like the opposite would be the grass beds. Grass bed fish just don't necessarily move very much. They're pretty much there and you got to figure it out. And I think that's why so many Florida guys come up and kick butt on the Potomac River comparatively to other places. I, I suck in Florida. I suck on the Potomac. It's the same. <laughs> well, well, then what has been your success execution wise and strategy wise on the James that people could learn from that and just big, big picture stuff with dealing with that fast moving yeah, current, yeah. current and everything. I'd say the biggest thing is like really pay attention and practice. So if, if you're practicing up there, like, and you get a bite, you need to instantly drop your power poles, whatever it is. If you get a quality bite, a little dink, whatever, or you get two bites in a row, something where you're like, okay, what is this? Sit down, look at the graph, pull up your tide chart. Lawrence, I can hit uh, tides and it'll pull up the nearest one to me. Pay attention there though, because the James does get curvy at times. So sometimes it'll pull up the closest one as the crow flies but not actually mm. as the river flows. So just pull up the, or you can scroll and actually tap on it and you can like hit it and it'll pull up the actual tide chart. Pay attention to the exact water height, the direction of flow. That's really important. The tide matters for 80% of your bite, your cast matters for 10% and the time of day matters for the other 10%. So that's the biggest thing I learned is just really paying attention to your conditions, water, color, and bait kind of go into that tide thing i'd say as well like the tide matters for if you're like let's say you practice but you pull into a spot and it's the same tide as the right tide but last weekend when you were catching them there there's bait everywhere it's flickering and you get in there and it's brown water and there's no bait or vice versa uh, it's that's kind of just understand you have to really pay attention to things i think the small details matter there in my opinion more than like a reservoir is the is the James and I'll include the chick on this. Is yeah. it more so a wood or hardcover body of water historically than like the Potomac when you have like like we said the massive grass beds? I mean, once you get above Hopewell, there's little to no grass. You get some spatter dock here and there, and there's don't get me wrong, there is grass out there. There's somebody's laughing at me that has a secret grass bed, but yeah, um, for the most part, it's hardcover. It's a lot of man made structure. When you get below Hopewell, you start looking at that mix between the wood, the pads, the, the hydrilla beds. Um, I want to say it was one of the guys in that MLF LW, the, the step below the BPT they have that came here a couple of years ago, um, the old FLW tour. One of the guys was catching on fishing literally like a Potomac grass flat in the middle. I think it might have been the dude that just Greco that just won on the Potomac. Um, I know you had him on, but he caught a few. It was either him or one of the mother guys that fishes it, but they were literally fishing it like the Potomac out hmm. off the bank, fishing a grass bed in one of those middle creeks of the James. So interesting. it's a good mix. Um, I'd say I'm definitely stronger fishing wood, but uh, D -d -does, that, a does that create a different cultural mindset when you fish? Cause I think when you, when you fish a hardcover thing, 
generically, again, guys, this is, I'm just saying broad terms. If you go down a line of brush, you're probably not going to go back through there. But if you're fishing a grass bed, you could go all day going back and forth through that thing, trying to figure out where the juice is. So you want to stay in an area. And I feel like guys that come up here that are used to hitting hard targets, whether it's like you're from the Carolinas, you're brush pile fishing, you're dock fishing, you're bouncing. The idea of staying in one creek and fishing a whole grass bed gives you the shakes because you feel like you have to move and leave and go somewhere. Is that kind of about right with the James where it just, it, it's not as conducive to sit in one spot or is that, is that completely you know inaccurate? There's two ways to look at it. You can sit in a spot and wait for the bite to turn on because there'll be two or three bite windows throughout the day. Um, and when those bite windows happen, you better be ready. Um, and then there's the other one where people kind of have identified, I like this tide at this spot, this tide at this spot, and they map out a run and they run 60 miles throughout the day. So they're always casting in productive water. Um, you know, there's, that's the two different mindsets. I've done both. I've had success doing both. I really just let the, like the, tournament tell me so if it's out of hopewell i know a lot of the stuff around there is going to be crowded because 50 percent of the field won't run more than 10 miles in any tournament any tournament we're going out of norman i'm not even practicing on that end of the lake near blythe because 50 percent of the field will be down there so if you, i kind of take that into effect as well where the tournament's interesting from. If you're out of osborne anything that's below hopewell now the chickahominy is kind of different because 50 percent of the field just runs there anyway um, but that, if you take the Chickahominy out of it, the rest of the field that doesn't go to the chick is going to be around Osborne. Nobody runs that it. it's, it's weird, but fishermen either run the hero run or they don't run at all. Yeah. That's so interesting. Cause I've always thought about that. Cause everyone asks me that comes up here for all these Potomac river tournaments, what to do. And I, and I just tell them like, I, I suck at doing milk runs. Every milk run I've done has ended horrifically. I just don't time it right. And if you sit you get to learn where they move through the whole title thing. How do you, how do you, have you developed so much confidence in doing a milk run and not like shit, I, I missed my window by five minutes. I was talking about this with my buddy yesterday. Um, like when I fish lakes, when I fish other, I like to lock myself in an area. So that area could be 20 miles, but it at least gives me like a comfort in knowing that I'm not going to complete. If I spin out, I have three or four super confident spots that I can just go sit in and settle down. Um, when I went to the Potomac, I didn't have that. So I was literally just running around like chicken with my head cut off and that spin out happens that, that first year I fished elite 70, I didn't catch a single check. And I did do that. I tried to force spots. I thought, Oh, there's so much money on the line. I got to force it. I got to go. Mm -hmm. I got to go. If I just sat down and fished, I think I would have had a lot more success. I know I would have had a lot more success, but, um, yeah, that's been the biggest thing for me is just sitting down and yes, the milk run, but do it within your comfort zone. If you're not comfortable or not confident in your equipment or make it that 60 mile run, don't do it. There's plenty of fish to be caught. It's all just staying where you're, where you truly believe you're making the best cast you can be making at that time. Yeah, that's really good information because there's so many people that think because they have the motor that they should run from, you know, Mattawoman to, you know, Aquia to Potomac Creek back and forth. And Unless you are so, <laughs> I did it too, but unless you are like, you know, the exact stump that you might hook one on the, the time that you're running. And if you, I don't know how many times that my, my stupid graph or my app says the tide's supposed to come in at this time and it doesn't, it's a little earlier, it's a little late. And it, there is something to be said that you kind of cut down your area. And, and Greco talked about this when I had him on where it's like, yeah, like this is my generic area, but I'm not going to run like way up to DC or way down South because I'm just, I'm just chewing up too much time. And coming from a grass guy that kind of really, really perked my ears, like he wants to maximize his time with a bait in the water. Yeah. And and that's something that I think in the old Bass Masters, you were always taught by like the Iconel. It's like, you got to do the milk run. That's how you win. But I, it depends on, on where you go. And yeah, that, that whole, the James is so alluring because you do have this one creek on the ass end of the world, which is you know, Chick Chickahominy River. And I say ass end compared to where Bass Masters and everyone launches from, where it is yeah, inducive right. to like... Uh, Yes, everyone wants to go. And it's just, I don't know. It I had a I had a friend come on the show a while back and he said what's crazy is like there's always like two years that the chick just goes off and then everyone pilchers that thing. The chick dies for a couple of years and the James is hot and it kind of repeats this pattern. Um have you seen anything well, like well, there's definitely fish there? Really? Yeah, I mean, so three years ago, that first year of the late 70s, we were on a damn bag on the James. I mean a bag we we had 
25 pounds in like two hours the weekend before they were still there the day before. And, uh, we decided that it was one of those bad decisions I was talking about. We tried to force our way into a Creek and buried it on a log and sat there for three hours. Oh, shit. Tide to come in. By the time the tide came in, that bite window was gone. Um, I, that was again, not paying attention to details. So caught up in the moment of the, the six, seven grand on the line. Right. So that was a big learning experience, but that year, nine of the top 10 were in the Chickahominy. Every single tournament that came there, the open came there that year. Everybody was catching them out of the chick. The big weights were coming out. There it was like 18 pounds. It was like laughing stock out there. It was the biggest weights I can remember on the James. The next year the chick played. Um, then this year, it seemed like when I, I try to pay attention, um, talk to people that I know, I'm, obviously I don't want to fish for their spots or info, but the Chickahominy didn't have the year that it's had. Um, and everybody was complaining, saying the river's down bad, that the fish are dying. They were out there doing virus studies. But honestly, in my opinion, I think it was because of that prolonged spring we had. Mm-hmm. Like I said, there's so much current on the James that the fish like to congregate when it gets really hot. And that is what's conducive for big bags. They want to be in moving water. They want to be in those current breaks. They want to be around that fresh grass. There's only but so many of those spots. So if you can get on a, for lack of better words, a school of them, that's where those big bags come from. Where you saw this year, once the heat kicked in, I mean, that's when you started seeing 23, 24, 22, 20. Where all spring, we only saw like what, one 20 pound bag and a cat. And that was about it. Yeah. And that's, the, I'm glad you brought that up because I think it comes down to, I think there's a couple of factors that play into that. I think, I think one is like the amount of cover that the fish have in that given year. You know, if you take and you have 30 acres of woods, you're going to have, you're going to have a lot of deer, you know, for the 30 acres. But then if you take the 30 acres and cut it in half, you might still have the same deer population you had a year ago. So it's going to feel like you know, the woods is abound with them. And when you have years on the Potomac, for example, where the year before you had good vegetation and then it just died off the next year, all of a sudden you're catching fish left and right. It's because you have so many fish biomass in such a small area that they can, they can hide. And I don't think people really think about that when it comes like for, you know, SAV, if you have a shit ton of it, it's not that the, the, the fishery sucks. It's just that they're really hard to get to. And so it protects them a little bit. And, and do you see like there's a lot of vegetation on the river this year compared to other years? I'd say there was less and the weights were down this year. So I think that adds up. How's the salinity? Um, I'm pretty sure it's high because one of my buddies was posting pictures catching redfish underneath the Route 5 bridge at Chickahominy. So yeah, jeez, um, do I don't have any real gauge there, but uh, I'm pretty sure it is. The water was not nearly as clean one of the, the few times that I was down there this year. Like there's some stuff below the chick that I used to like to fish and the water's been dirty the last couple of years when I went down there. So I think that has to do with less grass to clean it. I don't, I don't know exactly, but I think it does. And then, I mean, you tell me with the Potomac, uh, was there a lot of grass this year? It seemed like there was when I was up yeah. there. I had nothing to compare it to. Yeah, we're, we're on the uptick really with the grass in years past. And then, you know, guys, a great episode to go listen to is like the Bob Petty uh, interview. And he's the guy that runs Potomac teams for the last 30 years and has data out the ass forever. And he talks about mm-hmm. back when DC was a carpet uh, and Steve Chaconis talks about this too. Um, but, but yeah, with that said, uh, it, it is on the uptick, all the vegetation and that does piss some people off because then they're like, well, there's just too much vegetation. It's hard to find them. The weights are down because of it. And, and if you have two or three good years with the vegetation we have, that means the population is going to bounce up because there's more area. I mean, that's that's so a say, new sh- weren't, the, weren't the weights pretty good on the Potomac this year? I thought they were good, but some people will say like, well, it wasn't like it used to be, you know, 50 years ago or some shit like that. But it, you, you can't make people happy. I, I look at personally, what I look at for a good fishery is how, what the weights are low. So example is if you look at like at Lake Champlain, and in 50th place, everyone has 13 pounds and, and, it's, and it's tight. It's insane. And then a great, I'll, I'll use this as an example, the upper bay. I, holy crap. Yeah. It's like two people caught 30 pounds and then 90% of the field blanks. It, yeah. that place is depressing. The, leads go there. the top end weights are insane, but the guys down the bottom might not even have a limit. So it's, yeah. it's a great big fish fishery, but it's not very fertile. It's not. And and I think the James and really the Potomac are insanely fertile. And and when they're on, you can see just how much weight you can catch. You can have a shitty day on the James or the Potomac when they're on and you still have fun. You go to Kerr 
you're going to catch three pounds. Everyone's going to catch three pounds, but it's just, uh, is that me? That's a whole other I, topic. I got right a house on her and I hate that place. So really, <laughs> I suck there. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've ever cashed a check there. <sighs> that place is so fascinating. Cause some people, I mean, I know if I check my comment section, people love that place and hate that place. And, and, and I, oh, and I, so fun. yeah, it's so fun. Go down there in March, throw a crankbait, throw a shaky head. You'll catch a billion fish if the weather's decent. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, tournament fishing there just is not my thing. I try and I'm going to continue to try, but, uh, yeah, it's just the weights. And and again, every time I say it's the weight, somebody's like, well, you know, this one time I caught 25 pounds. Like I get that, but I'm saying like when it takes eight pounds to cash a check on a BFL, like that's like, good Lord, that place is, is hurting. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what can be done about that, but that's why I think they need to rotate lakes. Like, again, I put that up there, Lake Anna or Gaston, something like that. When all these other lakes are popping off, give them a chance to shine. Gaston could handle it. Gaston's got uh, that summit ramp, I think, is down at the bottom that Bass Nation goes out of. That they handle a good bit of boats out of there. Because um, about half the field would launch on the other side and boat over, just like Potomac. Um, Anna, I fish that a lot. It's going to get really crowded really fast with 100 boats out, 150 boats out there. I fished one of those anglers appreciation tournaments that they used to have out of uh, fishtails, and it was 130 boats, and there were people everywhere. The other part of it is that there's no parking. So it was out of uh, Anna Point, which is where fishtails is. High Point was full also, and then I talked to like a bunch of people that launched down to Sturgeon Creek, and that was also full. So 130 boats on Anna, there's not a launch that can handle it. You're yeah. talking about 100, you do 150 boats on Anna. Most team tournaments, the boater and the co-angler, vast majority ride there together. You talk about but BFLs, you're doubling the amount of cars and parking spots you need. I just, I don't think there's a facility at Anna that can handle it. I don't think there's a facility. I think the lake could definitely handle it because it'd be like High Rock. Like High Rock, it's a little bit busy, but yeah. you're still... If you had a BFL on there, you see somebody break a dirty 30 if it was like early March. Um, I, I think that could happen. I mean, there's yeah. has been two dirty 30s broken out of there now. Yeah, in like January though. January? When they're scoping. Yeah, they're scoping them. Because I had on, and, and guys, I guess this episode would have already dropped. I had Odenkirk on, um, and we talked about since he runs like Anna, and he said like the F1s haven't even started to come in yet. Um, he said they're two years, three years in. So he said in three to four years, you're going to see those kick in. So he said the weights are still going to go up. And that made my jaw drop when he said like, yeah, this 25 pounds will be all in the top five. He said in a couple of yeah. years, it's coming. And that to me is like, that's so freaking cool to see that. But yet we're still going to go to Kerr and catch three pounds. It's like... Uh, you know, I, I get if a lake is tight, but I really wish these organizations would at least give nods to lakes that are doing good. So it's like the Bassmasters always puts Clear Lake in the top, you know, four, but they're never going to go there. So why the hell are you going to do it? Like promote, if, if a lake is fishing good, then let's go there. Give these other lakes a yeah. rest. My issue with the BFLs is like you look at Shenandoah this year, they're going to the Potomac twice and the James twice. They're both good fisheries, but why? That's not a... I joked with one of my buddies. That's, they should rename that the title division, not the Shenandoah. I mean, you're going to Smith Mountain once and those two twice. Well, and, and that's like the real reason I really wanted Lake Anna back is that way you could put Lake Anna on the Shenandoah division and, and you're not going to Kerr. Yeah. Um, you could. The, the question is, you'd have to... The way they'd have to do it is it would have to be launched out of Anna Point or High Point and they'd have to get both, yeah. both ramps to commit to clearing for them. Because the issue with Anna Point is they've got all those businesses up top and all the weight boots and stuff are all just sitting in the parking lot during dry storage season. Oh, so, I, I agree. Like the ramp have to be fixed, but as, as a commenter said, if you have that tournament, you're not going to have it in June when there's party boaters. You'd have that as an early, early tournament. Yeah. I mean, but you fished Anna. It, it was, it's disgusting there. Those guys catch them. Um, it would be yeah, really yeah. good. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Is like you, you fished there before, and I don't think people appreciate because somebody in my comments actually said like it's the Dead Sea. And it's like, dude, that is not the Lake Anna we have now. It's 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 a getting to be a better lake. It's just that stupid dike sucks because it cuts that lake in half. And if you Google it, it says it's thirteen thousand acres, and it's not. It's actually just I think nine thousand fishable acres. So if that was gone, that would be one of the premier fisheries in Virginia by far. Yeah, I could see that. I mean. 
that place is ridiculous right now. We went, I, I remember when 10, 12 pounds, I'd be happy. I'd probably go home with a check on a Sunday morning. There's still some days like that, but like now, <laughs> I mean, we went there and we we made bad decisions, but it took like 24, 25 pounds to win and, and like 18 to get paid. We were, our jaw was on the floor. We mm-hmm. were like, this is insane. And the wind was gassing. And the day before it was the biggest waves I've ever seen on that lake. I mean, it, and they were still catching them. And so it, it's, uh, that place is getting a lot of bigs in there. It's getting better every year, it seems like. With that said, what is the hardest place for you to fish that really had to test your skills? So I'd say Smith Mountain from like a versatility standpoint. Really? Um, <laughs> yeah, because I think you got to be able to do a lot of things. I mean, you can be a one trick pony, but when you're not from there, you got to be able to adjust to the conditions. Uh, and then, but honestly, the Potomac has tested me the most this year because there's grass, there's wood. Like I actually made a really good decision in the last BFL. I had one fish from the grass that I caught a billion out of the weekend before and shook a bunch off the day before. Um, I fished my best three grass beds until like noon. I was doing the right thing, being slow. The grass bite was just dead at the top 10 that day. There were like two people fishing grass. At one o'clock, pulled the plug, went to go fish wood and caught a limit. And that got me into the regional. Yeah, I didn't get a check, but it got me into the regional. I was fighting for my life after that last zero. But the from a versatility standpoint, I'd say Smith Mountain, you got to be the most versatile. I want to hit on that Potomac tournament because I think that's interesting what you said, going from grass to wood. How much of a run did you make to make that execution? Was it you're in the same creek, you're just flipping basically oh, the yeah. type of cover? or? I mean, the first place, I, I was fishing docks. I didn't know, there's no secret. Um, I, I was fishing docks with a wacky worm is what I went to go do, fish wood. And I was fishing down a grass flat, and I, it was my last of my best three grass flats and didn't get a bite. And I was like, that dock, look, dock looks pretty good. Let me try that. I caught some fish off docks in practice, broke off like a three-pounder or two-and-a-half-pounder, my first cast under there, and I was like, okay. Ran to some more docks and caught fish and broke off more fish all day. Wow. There's, there's a lot of barnacles in, in the bottom end of the Potomac right now. That whole Aquia, Potomac, um, what is it, Nanjamoy, they all got a lot of barnacles on the wood down there. So I learned that the hard way. Um, the Chickahominy is that way right now too. But, yeah, it's uh, – I don't want to talk about lost fish, but, yeah, just go straight up to the docks and – I just started fishing in the same creek that I knew the population of fish was in. Again, talking about that area thing. And I was just expanded on it. I never left that creek until 30 minutes left in the day. Did you did you check out Ninja Point? In practice, yeah. How'd that go? It sucked. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't catch a fish. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm playing the long game that eventually it's like you play the same lottery numbers and it'll hit. There's no way that place is going to go 50 years without producing a winning bag. Didn't so, I eventually the FLW tour or something there a couple of years ago? Potomac Creek. Yes, no, yes. Like it was like the Italian guy, like Galele or something. I yeah, Galele. He was in Potomac Creek. Um oh, okay. and before that, Potomac Creek was dead for a long time. And then that came mm-hmm. back. And then I think Skeet Reese back in 06 or 08 was the last time I, it was one out of Nanjamoin which is a long ass time ago, but what's funny is like, I remember in high school going to Port Tobacco and Angie went and catching them, but it, for some reason, all of a sudden it just died. And there's a lot of grass and wood in the back of that thing for it just to go, but there's good snakeheads still. Yeah. I didn't get a bite. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you, what is your set? What? I said not one. <laughs> That's crazy. That's really crazy. So, so what is your setup like to deal with barnacles? I just keep up sizing my line. I think that I'm a firm believer that these fish on these tournament fisheries, they get a ton of pressure. The bait falls more naturally on fluorocarbon than it does braid. People tell me I'm wrong, but my co was throwing the same exact worm as me with straight braid on the back of the boat. He got zero bites. I got probably 10 or 15 bites. Um, wow. So I just keep up sizing my fluoro. I think in dirty water, the size of the fluoro doesn't really matter that much. I start with 10, no matter the water color and adjust from there. Um, so I bumped up to 12 and then eventually to 14 and at 14 on a spinner rod, you start to lose castability when you go any bigger. And I didn't have any break offs once I went to 14. That's interesting. Yeah. I don't think people play around with that stuff enough because it's so funny that, um, you know, a lot of the Potomac guys up here, not, not all of them, they really are just, they're not as, 
they don't look at those details. I think about like all the line sizes, they think, you know, 12 pound or whatever, it's good enough. Just go with that. But when you have experience fishing different bodies of water, I think that opens your mind to different leader sizes and really dialing that in. I mean, because you're going from, you know, the James of the Potomac to Smith or, or Kerr. And I really do think making those small adjustments going from dirty tidal water to clear spot lakes, it's, I think it's big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree. Going, going back to the James River now, um, we are, we're entering like late October, we're getting into the late October season here. What can you expect out on that river just from a fishing report standpoint and just, a, and just what you're going to see the, the body of water do? So I'm going to speak more on prior experience. I haven't been out there since the last BFL I fished out there really. Or no, no, I fished a cat. I fished two cats since that BFL. I fished, we, we did good in one and okay in the other. Um, and so go, I, but I fished a bunch in the fall and past. So this time of year is, is going to be notoriously tough for a little bit. Um, and then once you start, that grass starts to get dead, you start to see some guys drop some bags and some guys struggle. Um, Mike Cherry is supposed to be friends with him on Facebook. It's very entertaining, but he'll post crazy videos of him just catching them on a glide. And I mean, just catching them on his, on his cherry bomb crankbait, on um, the Chickahominy and the James. And I mean, guys catch big ones from like mid October, late, early November to February. And mm. then everybody else shows up back out on the water because it's fishing season. And in my opinion, March gets tough for a little bit and then the fish start to get really active and it's just lights out from there until you get to like August. What are gener generically the patterns that you're looking for that time of year? It, since the grass is dying, are you just looking for the first hard cover or do the fish completely leave these areas? I'm on hard cover pretty much after that. This, once the fall starts setting in, I'm going back to the hard cover and, um, the current plays, but really I'm looking for bait and, and this sounds weird, but not happy bait. If you go in a pocket and you just see bait swimming around, like nothing's chasing it. I don't want that bait. I want the bait that's all scattering on the surface. It's every time you touch the troll motor, it's popping out of the water. That's that bait that's scared for its life. That means there's something there to eat. What, what type of bait are you generally seeing right now? Is it, is it pilchards? Is it shad? Is it like, what is it? Those big American shad run up the James. Um, so like they do the shad fishing for the shad row in the spring and fall, I think is when they do it. I've never done it. So I don't know, but the big American shad get in there. So you'll see those. Um, but really I'm looking for just the, the eatable ones, the small ones, because in the fall, the small bait fish tend to survive better for some reason. I don't know why, but I'm looking for those little ones. When, when it comes to bait and, and you're looking for bait, let's say you're pre-fishing for a tournament. How long do you think the bait stays? So you go into Pocket X on a Friday, do you and you see bait? Do you expect confidently that okay, I can go back there tomorrow and it's going to be there? Or, or what if it's like you saw it on Wednesday? Do you run there Saturday during the tournament? Like, how long do you think the bait should stay there? Typically speaking, that's a that's a hard question. I mean, like I I'd love to say that yeah, it stays there two days, but I've seen it stay there for two weeks and I've seen it stay there for twelve hours, like. I don't know what the science is to it. I think it's more water clarity and salinity than anything. Um, but there's no way to judge that until you see the water at that point. So, so, so yeah. How do you practice then? So if you have three days yeah. and you find great shit on a Wednesday, like how does, how does that work? My last day, I'm going to run around and lay eyes on my best stuff. I may not cast. I want to look at it. Okay. Yeah. I don't often get that much practice anymore. Um, working a full-time job, but like this week at Norman, I'm getting a, a full week. And so I'm going to, my last day I'll spend, I'll, I'll, I'll just spend the first half of the day going to lay eyes on all my stuff because I can roll into a pocket. And this is a lesson I learned fishing college. We fished that championship in grand and there was ice on the water every morning and water was dirty everywhere. And the one spot that we didn't check during practice or at least lay eyes on was the Creek that the top five of the top 10 were in couple i mean one of my best friends or not best friends but good buddies was in got second he was almost won the thing in that creek um and the only reason we didn't go in there is because we went when we dropped the troll motor to start working our way back in the steering cable on the ultrax popped and so we pulled it up and called up a shop and went and get, got that replaced and just never went back in there um just 
didn't think about it. It was kind of like, oh, you know, mentally we thought we had gone in there. We didn't really go in there. And in the back of that creek, there was clean, warm water dumping in from something. Hmm. And so now I kind of, I try to lay eyes on my best stuff. I try to let, if especially if I'm going like Norman this week, I'm going to try and see the whole lake and then practice from there. And then at the end of practice, I'm going to lay eyes on my best stuff and make sure it's nothing's drastically changed. Now, at this point in your career, do you have forward-facing sonar at all? Or are you still without it? I got it. I've had it. <laughs> um, I'm, I use it. I can't say I'm proficient with it, but I use it. I can catch some on it. How the does spots that... are a lot easier than the large mouth. <laughs> yeah, because like that's gonna say like, how does this incorporate into your practicing? Um, I saw this fascinating thing on. I think it was maybe it was Wired to Fish. This guy was uh, practicing for the the Bassmaster Open. I think it was Lake of the Woods. It was one of those uh, Ozark lakes. And he actually had a kayak pole next to his console. And so he would literally just drive right next to all the docks and look underneath of it and then just waypoint the docks ahead bait. And I was like, this is where it's going because good God, is that going to save time? And, and so like, how do you, if you're in a bait mindset, yeah, how much are you even, since you have forward facing center, are you making yeah. a cast or is it just scan? Yep. There's bait, drop the pen, leave. You've got my brain turning now. Um, that's now, really right? cool. I saw some of the elite guys doing that up at Champlain and I was like, man, that's really cool. I am, I got here by fishing my strengths. I'm going to do that. I'm going to power fish. Uh, I, I'm going to have a back, couple backup things, but I'm going to spend most of my time trying to find the best stuff. Uh, it's a, you got to finish in the top six to make the all American. Yeah. I'd love to make a check and get out of there, but you want, you're shooting for the top six out of like 200 guys probably. Sure. You know, on a lake, you don't know. I'm not going to try and reinvent the wheel. I try to use what little off season there is, you know, from November to February to get the boat right and then go play with forward facing because that is when the guys catch them the best on it. Um, but I just, I, I really, this year, we haven't used it a ton. I've I had it off, I'd say, in 80% of the tournaments. It'll be on for this one um, just because, like, you can use it to see the, I use it to see cover a lot. So like, see if there's a brush pile under the dock, see if there's a, if it's a dredge dock on, but I scoping individual fish, I'm not going to try and do that. The bait thing. I mean, I, if I see one, I'm going to cast at it, but <laughs> I'm not going to go float out in the abyss. The bait thing. That's really interesting. I'm not sure what I'll do there. Yeah. It was just, I literally saw that, uh, again the other day and I just thought like that's interesting where and then guys if you don't know what I'm talking about I'll try I'll try to link it in the episode description but um for kayaks there's a little pole you can you can hook your panoptics mm. mount to and so he bolted that to the side of his boat his console so he could just drop it down and watch it on his console grass and then just scan underneath the docks and go and not make a cast um, I think Brian knew him that at Champlain if you look on his Instagram I think he had it up there which yeah, it saves time. But then again, the question that popped into my mind that I wrote down is like, well, then how long do you give a spot with bait? Because bait moves so freaking much. Kerr, I mean, you can have some docks that like, yeah, there's bait under it, but the next day it's gone. And I mean, yeah. I don't think there's an answer to that, but like that's the issue when you're chasing a, just a pure bait bite is shit will move. Yeah, I don't know that I'm chasing a pure bait bite in this one. Um, bait's important. I more use it as like an evaluation of the area tool. Yeah, it's on that dock one day, but it may be three docks down. But in this tournament, I think I'm going to really be focused in on getting in an area that I'm comfortable. Like I said, it might be a 20 mile area, yeah. but an area that I'm comfortable, spend time in practice identifying what's good there, like the high percentage areas, and then fish through it thoroughly in the tournament. And if the bait was on the this good dock over here one day, and it's on this good dock the next day, I'm going to fish both of those docks during the tournament anyway, so it doesn't matter. I'm going to run into them. Hopefully. <laughs> what, what do you, what else besides this tournament do you have coming up? Uh, off season. <laughs> that, well, hopefully preparing for the all American, but no, this will be the, the last. So the elite 70 classic is the same weekend okay. on gas. So my partner will be out there. Uh, he'll be out there fishing by himself on, he just bought a boat. So he'll be out there. And then if I don't make the cut at the, um, regional, my buddy Jake and I were both fishing the regional. We both also fish at Elite 70. Both of us have said, like, hey, if we don't make the cut, we're just going to roll straight to Gaston that night and hop in y'all's boats for the second day and go fishing. So either way, I'll be fishing Saturday. I hope it's on Norman. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I think that with Gaston that same weekend, so that's the only other thing that it could be. And then really it's just going to the beach with some friends and getting ready for the uh, 
for the new year. All right, are you going to be fishing any of the uh, the winter elite tournaments at Lake Anna? No. Nope. I'm not, you... not donating to those boards. They're so good. Yeah, I mean, they're... like, yeah. Like I said, I fish tournaments all throughout the spring, most of the summer, and then now into the fall with the BFL schedule. So it's like I try to take the winter to get the boat right, hone in those skills. Yeah. No. Work on live scope. Well, that's the thing too, I was going to say like winter time is definitely your live scope time to kind of get used to all that uh, and get that dialed in. Cause yeah, I mean, for better or worse, it's going to play. It's just figuring out how much to use it. I mean, I've had, I've had McCluskey on the show, which in, in our area, he is, he is really, oh, yeah, he's, a dog. he's a, he's a dog and good God. He just, you throw him on a boat on Lake Ann in the winter time, he can still catch him as long as you give him scope. But I, I don't say that he, he's good without it too. But the, the fact is like, yeah, it's just so hard because it does play and it's playing more on tidal water than I ever thought it would in, in, in weird ass ways. And that was so interesting that if you asked me that a couple of years ago, I would have said no way in hell, but yeah, people are figuring out how to make that work. Um, I heard a guy say like, you can even pan it towards a grass, a grass bed to see if there's a good canopy. And it's like, that's freaking genius. Like it's just little things like that, that people are figuring out. The last open they had on James, I want to say there was two guys in the top 10 scope and grass edges in the Chickahominy. Mm. And that was when I was like, holy crap, I am behind. Um, yeah. Like, you think you know everything about a fishery until guys from out of town come in, especially some Japanese dudes with baits you've never seen. Dude, I I think I'm, I know the tournament you're talking about because they want it like damn near right next to the boat ramp uh, with, again that mindset of just not having to drive, but just picking a place apart is so interesting because everyone over here in America hates that, but they're fine with it and they cash checks. And I think there's something to it because boat pressure is only going to get worse. Yeah. I mean, their lakes are like the size of my house. Like yeah. Small. They're tiny lakes. You can fit four boats on them and they cram 20 out there. I mean, it's, they're so used to it. I mean, if you look back at when Ike went over there, he came back with so many techniques and, I don't know much about the Japanese people, but I watched a lot of that. And like, you can like see 10 boats behind him while he's fishing. It's crazy. I'd want to fight everybody. Yeah, why, why do you think that is? Cause I, I don't know mentally what it is about us over here that we hate crowds. We just feel like we can't fish in them. And I think that's so it's true. People hate it, but in some instances you have to do it. I mean, Potomac river and Florida is a great example. If this is the grass bed that they're at, you got to deal with it or you're going to suck. Yeah. Yeah. The Potomac, I'm not going to lie. It makes me mad sometimes. There's, <laughs> guys can be, cause like, so there's, there's fishing in a crowd and then there's being an asshole, right? I mean, yeah. You got the guys that cross the line. You got the guys that see you catching them and all of a sudden it just goes, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, what's going on that turn that elite 70 where we were catching them. We were, we were fishing this like grass edge almost. And there was a dude across the Creek from us. And he, they could clearly see it. And we caught a couple of good ones. We were probably hooting and hollering. And all of a sudden, they rolled in on the bank behind us. And we're like, and we were going up and down, up and down. And it wasn't necessarily a bank, but it, you know what I mean? Like a mat, grass yeah. edge type deal. And if they rolled up, it's clear what we're fishing. And they rolled up behind us and started fishing down. And so we kept going back and forth. And then basically, I was like, well, you know what? Screw it. And I just dropped the power poles down, didn't move for like 10 minutes until they left. <laughs> because they were just like you can't that's there's a line there right so there's mm -hmm. guys that do, may do it on accident they may roll in and not realize that they're pulling it on you we may think that oh they just saw us catch that and that's why they're pulling in there and they might just be pulling into their second best spot and that's why it's the second stop of the day but then there's the guys that clearly like i was uncomfortable that tournament i zeroed because um could do those fish that fishes the elite 72 was sitting out there blistering them and I mean, he was catching them cast after cast right in front of me while I'm not catching anything. And I didn't want to get too close to him, but I'm trying to get around him to the other side of the grass mat. And I'm like, hey, bud, where do you want me to go? And he's like, dude, it's the Potomac. Just go right behind me. And I'm like, ah, I don't like that. Dude, it's the Potomac. I love that line. Yeah. It's, so like, he was cool about it. But like at the same time, you do pull that shit on the James without, he, without saying, hey, I'm going around you. Communication fixes everything. Yeah. Like I pulled up, I, I learned that you just have to deal with it. And I had never dealt with it, but like this year, the last BFL up there, the super tournament, when I pulled in at the end of the day to a spot and I was like, Hey, which way are you going? Cause I'm trying to go here. And if you're going there, I'm going to leave. And he was like, no, I'm going this way. So I just went behind him once he went up. 
that's why boating ethics is so hard because if you try to pull that shit on Lake Anna or something like that, like I would even get upset with that. But when you fish springtime tournaments on the Potomac and they're all in Belmont Bay and you're, you're going to have 600 boats in there. And it, it really is mental fortitude of understanding. Like you said, you, you catch a good one. You got your cast lined up, you power pull down, have a sandwich until everyone leaves and everything calms down. You can make your cast, catch another one, power pull down again. Cause everyone, the circle's going to tighten. I, I know what that's like a hundred percent, but it's all mental that you got to just, you got to block that out and understand that you're at the juice because I, I, we do, we, we get so allured with the guy that wins by running 600 miles, but then they don't tell you all the stories of all the idiots that didn't win, but just burnt $600 worth of petrol. Um, yeah. And I don't know. And I'm not good at that. I keep trying to fight that. Like what's better to run or to stay. And, you know, I, I, I'm probably feeling like a broken record at this point, but Nolan Miner, just the one thing he said where he realized when he got in a kayak, how many fish are actually in an area. And it's like, yeah, I never, just because you have a 250 or, or 225 or whatever, doesn't mean you need to use it 24 seven, but it's how do you balance that versus sit? I just need to catch five and eight hours and they're here versus let's hit every point and be productive and hit the high percentage areas. And it's what makes it fun. Yeah. I mean, if, if we could figure that out, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about it. We'd oh my be, God. Uh, you're not joking. Oh my God. You're not joking. Good. You're not joking. It, it's, I mean, it's cool. The The fun part about it is that chase, right? Uh, trying yeah. to figure it out. But I, I, I don't like the whole conversation about hole jumpers. There's definitely hole jumpers out there. But I, I mean, I think I was actually talking about this with some buddies the other day. Like, yes, people hole jump. And it's the, all the talk on the Elite Series is these young guys are hole jumping. If you listen to any of those podcasts, you hear them all talking about it. But every guy that comes on this podcast is talking about people hole jumping. So who's doing the hole jumping? There's only, I mean, you talk about elites and BPT, there's 180 top level pros. If that many guys are hole jumping, we'd know who it is because there's so many of them that are on a platform talking about hole jumping. How often is it more or less they're pros, they found the same stuff, they went to another spot and it didn't pan out, so they went to their B stuff the second day and it happened to be where it was going down. I That's think got to yeah. go down a lot. I, I agree. And I, I think the idea of like this hole jumping and, and, and all this spot ticker, that stuff's just got to go because again, this is not the 1980s. There's going to be more people fishing. Just deal with it. You know, a Brandon Polinick. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, what does it do? Bitching about it at all. It, it doesn't do anything. And I just think it gets you in a bad mindset. That's the thing too. I had a friend in the back of the boat. Uh, this, this wake board went past us and cut his line. And he just wanted to get to fight and everything. And it was like, I get it. It sucks. What are you going to do? You're going to fight him? We're not fucking fighting them tonight. So we're not doing that. So just retie and get out there. But if you're going to bitch about it, and, he, and you know, he complained about it for a little 20, 30 minutes. It's like, okay, you're just taking away from your fishing. Your mindset's just shit. And I think that mental side of it too, it, once you mentally tell yourself like, this is my spot and nobody else knows about it. If somebody's there, you're going to be so defeated mentally you won't be able to fish well because now you think this spot is somehow tainted because somebody else showed up. It, it, I think that's that's not good thinking wise when you're trying to make decisions. Yep, I agree with that. But I, I do think that a lot of times people aren't intentionally hole jumping, but there are oh, no. people that do, right? And so if you're going and if you, I just try to use my mouth. Like if if somebody if I think. If I think that you're going to think that I'm doing something wrong, I'm going to try and communicate it ahead of time. Hey, this is what I'm trying to do. Is that okay with you? Mm -hmm. You know, hey, I'm pulling up to into that creek that's past that jetty you're fishing. Is that okay? Or are you going in that creek? Because I don't want them thinking that I just jumped in front of them, right? Where <laughs> I'll probably, I, I know because I, I'm, I definitely get mad. If somebody jumped in front of me, I'll probably say something. Like yeah. I've said yeah. something to plenty of people. Uh, and so... You jump in front of me going into that creek when I'm in the jetty that's in the mouth of it working my way in without saying a word to me with your son hoodie up. That's a different conversation than if you said, hey, bud, I'm trying to go in there. Is that cool? And, and I also, I can't stress this enough, guys, for people that are listening. Um, I think it also depends on where you're at. Because again, I think sadly, there's not a blanket rule. If you're on Kerr, the rules are different than if you're on the Potomac, than if you're on James, than if you're on like a 5,000 acre lake in you know Indiana. Because you just have to be that way. Because if you're fishing a 300 boat tournament out of Lake Anna, 
deal with it. Do not, if you say that this is my dock, I will beat you with a stick because there's just not enough room. We're all fishing on top of each other. It's a merry-go-round. Deal with it. If it's Kerr and it's, you know, 100,000 acres, okay, I 100% get that. Like, you're on my shit. That's fine. But just understand, like, read the room of what you're dealing with lake-wise size. And, like, yeah, like, when you had all those pros on some of these smaller lakes, guys, come on, really? Like, yeah. you've gone to Lake Hartwell for the 50th time in 100 years. You know this place pretty well. Everyone knows the spots. So, mm -hmm. is there any secret spot when everyone knows all the spots? It, I don't know, but do you get that stuff when they go to Oahe or like some of these random places? Like, you don't, I don't seem like it's as much of an issue. That there. Was when they, I think that's when they talked about it a lot. Cause, like, from what I remember watching that tournament, there's not a lot of structure in that lake. There's like there's three spots. Guys, yeah. A lot of the guys were just like, oh, well, there's a boat over there. So, there's got to be structure. And so they would idle over there and practice and just go look at it. From what I heard through the, you know, the podcasts, watching coverage. I'm a fish head just like you. Where also, all and... there's only one gas station on that lake. Yeah, you can't so run that far. You can't run that far. That place is big, too. Mm -hmm. If they put a gas station, like, in the mid part of the lake, which, why would they? There's nobody there. But if they did just for that tournament or allowed them to plant gas cans on the bank like the old days, like, I think it would have been a lot cooler tournament. Um, yeah. And I, I think a lot of the guys that are that know that lake said that. Um, yeah. <laughs> Who who do you think what lake and we'll make this like the closing thought, but what, what lake do you think is the worst for that? For spot jumping? Potomac River. Potomac, really? Yeah, because like I said, you're on you're on a grass flat and like you may know about that hole that they're in. And granted, I'm not speaking from my own experience. I'm speaking from what I've seen because I've not known about many spots out there. But like somebody's catching them cast after cast after cast, and it shrinks around them really fast. And that's not an accident. I would think it would definitely be what first came to my head would be the St. Lawrence River, just because there has been so many tournaments there and everyone knows the spots now. Um, but what also came to my head was like uh, the Harris Chain or Okeechobee. Or like, like Teleco. Everybody tel was in. Um, yes. Everybody was in uh, Gussie's spot this year. That was a bad one. He, even, bad like, one. he ended up catching only like three out of that spot. And then he said there was a bunch of them there, but they were feeling the pressure. Um, he won it still, which is shows why he's the goat at smallmouth fishing, but uh, maybe not goat, but he's one of the best. And I mean, that's a good one. Good example. I think, yeah, Harris chain of Kachobe, but those places change so much. Mm -hmm. I think when you start looking at places that don't change, like the Potomac year I was thinking more of like day of hole jumping versus year uh, over year hole jumping. Gotcha. Okay. Like if you talk about year over year, it's going to be a place with hard cover, right? Because that stuff's not going to change. So it's got to be a Great Lakes, like a St. Lawrence and Erie and Ontario. Because if that boulder is there, it's going to be there for the next 30 years. And where like Okeechobee, that grass is going to move. Yeah. I, I see what you're saying. I went down to St. John's the year after they blistered them on, on the grass in uh, Big Lake George, and there was no grass in Big Lake George when we went. So it's like, you're not going to catch them there. So it's, it's everything changes on that. And like the Potomac is probably like that too. Like your waypoints probably work, but I'll find out next year on the grass flats if any of the waypoints are a whole the same. But it, I, it, I would venture to guess that the that it changes. It, it, it does, but I think... Uh, I, this would be a great, if anyone wants to do this spreadsheet, how many major creeks in each body of water just habitually play? Because I think Matta Woman and Nutbush are two great examples of this. Nutbush, not as much because Nutbush is basically a lake in of itself compared to Matta Woman. But, you know, Matta Woman, there are so many tournaments that dump fish. There is a reason why every major tournament, there's somebody in the top 10 that wins out of Matta Woman. Like, it, it's insane. And the same thing with Nutbush, and if it's and again a lesser extent, that those places because there's so many tournaments that dump fish, you really don't have to leave. I mean, you could if you if you want to and want to spend some time, but I'm I'm just shocked at how many people actually cash checks out of these couple of areas, and yet we'll spend a week practicing all over God's earth. All right. I'm guilty of it, um, but I think that Nutbush thing. It's probably more guys going, I don't want to tell them where I caught them, so I'm just going to say nutbush because it doesn't help anybody. It's like when guys say, I caught them mid-lake. <laughs> I caught them mid-lake. What does that mean? Like, mm -hmm. 
It's uh, I think that's like probably the the cop out Bugs Island answer if I was a gambling man, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, but I, I think I think Kerr is so interesting because you have such a catfish population. You have the striper. I think the blueback are starting to get in there pretty thick, but there's nothing. There's not a lot of wood. There's not a lot of like hydrilla. Um, so the one stump that's in there, that's it. And so if you graph around and you can find all that little juice, you got a hell of an advantage to everybody else. Mm-hmm. And, and the crazy thing too is like, I've grown up on, bu- on bugs with that house down there. Like there was a laid down tree there. So when I was a kid, that tree is still there. It's under sand now. Really? So you can't see it on the bank, but the sand moves around a lot on that lake when the water level goes up and down. Hmm. So the shallow stumps and stuff will change. But like you're saying, when you grab around and get all them rocks and stumps, like there's a guy out of Carolina um, that has a YouTube channel. I forget his name right now, but he's catching them offshore and he, he's just adding to it every year. And I promise one of these years, he's going to have a real good tournament out there. because He's just adding to it. And there's a few guys that do that. And I'm sure Tyler Trent's he- got it every piece of hard cover on that leg mark um which guys, yeah they, yeah i was, I was gonna cool. say yeah i was just gonna add to your point like that's where it shows you like that's where you can go and spending time on the water definitely helps you with those hard cover tournaments um i think bryson won the first bfl there and he talked about going mm-hmm. there in in january when the water's like insanely low and you can take pictures and shit and just see all the rock veins and stuff and like i was like oh shit that's a brilliant idea to do if you have time. Or how about the guys on, uh, <laughs> you remember when Lake Chesden about went dry back in the day? Oh, wow. Yeah. We had a drought and it was like dead dry. So I, I kind of grew up near there and like there were guys riding around in their golf carts with a battery and a, and a fish finder dropping waypoints on stumps and stuff. That's so smart. That's genius. Yeah. Like they couldn't get their boat out there. You couldn't even barely kayak down half the lake. It was so shallow. And like they would just ride around in a golf cart or walk around dropping waypoints. I'm I, I don't have Lawrence anymore, so I don't know what it's the newest uh, units can do. But can you transfer and save waypoints? I mean, let's say you took some Adderall and spent three weeks on Kerr, and you maxed out that some bitch in waypoints. Could you download them all to have them? Or you want to see, if you want to see my graphs? I didn't take any Adderall, but uh, it sure looks like it. Oh I mean, God. it's. Uh, there's my graph had, I just had to export some, some, uh, waypoints off my graph this week, preparing for Norman because it was getting running out of memory. Um, and that's HDS live. So I don't know how many gigs that is, but I know that I exported my, uh, some old college waypoints, but I mean, I think on bugs, I've got like 550 waypoints and none of them are any good, but I've got them. <laughs> like, they're there and, and basically I'm marking every piece of structure because like we said, that's not gonna move. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I try to if I like I try to mark like, okay, this this bush was in the water. And this comes back to that tide thing, I think, but this bush was in the water at water level of 299. So I know if it's 299 or up that that bush will be in the water. 299 below probably won't be. Stuff like that. Well like, water level is there. Thank you so much for coming on tonight. I, I really appreciate it. I want to keep you all night here since, since we're running up on yeah. it. Uh, please you know, take a moment, give a shout out. And is there any sponsors that we can promote for you? Yeah, no sponsors running sponsorless these days, but I will say like John, the guys over at missile have helped me out a lot throughout the days. I fished with his stepson in school and uh, gotten to know them. So they've given me some good advice. And then, uh, you know, the guys I run with keep, they keep us challenged, right? So I run with a guy named Jake Novak, Daniel Jenkins, Cooper Casillas, Wyatt Novak, and Bo Highland. That we literally traveled to almost all these tournaments together, split housing, and we all push each other. So I think there's a reason that Jake got a top 10 in the BFLs this year. There's a reason that Daniel makes every check in the Elite 70s. Bo, he's a goofball, but we'll leave him behind. But there's a reason that these guys do well, right? We push each other. Um, and so no sponsors, but really our group pushes us to the success. Well, I'll definitely have you back on and, and really good luck at Lake Norman. That's going to be, that's going to be a fun one to see how that, that pans out. Yeah. I'm excited. I went down there this weekend going back, uh, Sunday guys, again, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about. Uh, please like, and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out in the algorithm. If you'd like to join us on Patreon, we're only 64 members away from our first goal and huge shout out to the Patreon supporter of the week, which is John Mule. John, thank you so much for your support. Uh, we'll see you guys next time on fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to fishing the DMV. 
with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing in DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.